men and women, can you actually be friends? In what situations should you not be friends? Oh, no, no, no. We're just on a freight. And I said, a freight? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> What's a freight? I'm sorry, a freight? When to be picky and when not to be? Like, how? what is too picky? We actually wrote about that because we get that question all the time. How to flirt as a cat. For these people to think, oh my goodness, you know, <laughs> am I too picky because I want them not to look at porn? Am I too picky? It's like, dude. Can men and women actually just be friends? How about after a breakup? What are you supposed to do then? How about before a relationship? How do you know you're being too picky or maybe you're not setting your standards high enough? Uh, what about virtue? The role that that plays inside marriages and keeping those alive. Uh, we're going to dive into all this stuff today with uh, some of my favorite guests that we have on the show, Sarah Swafford and the husband, Dr. Andrew Swafford, a professor at Benedictine College. Uh, Sarah, as you know, is the author of the book, Emotional Virtue. And then they just came out with this book, uh, Gift and Grit, How Heroic Virtue Can Change Your Life and Relationships. And so we're going to dive into discussing those things with them on the show today and a lot more. Before we dive in, I again want to invite anyone who wants to come with us on pilgrimage to Italy this January. Sign up quick. I believe registrations close next month. So uh, bring your friends, bring your family. Not only do we have Father Augustino Torres coming as our chaplain, uh, he's just informed me that we've got four of the CFR uh, friars coming with us on the pilgrimage as well. And so we're going to be going to Assisi, to Rome, to see the tomb of St. John Paul II, the catacombs. Um, I'll have some nice Italian food along the way, uh, visit some shrines of Eucharistic miracles. So I want to go on pilgrimage to Europe, come with us. And so it's going to be in January. If you just go to chastity.com slash pilgrimage, uh, you'll see all the info right there to sign up, bring your whole family. Uh, I'd love to go on that trip with you. And then also just wanted to again, thank all of our supporters on Patreon. Uh, if you want to join the community, please just go to uh, patreon.com slash Jason Everett and uh, you can click to support maybe hey five bucks a month uh, to the mission here to keep lust is boring uh, growing and go going um, you could also give a little bit more and then uh, we can correspond via email uh, personal phone call we'll send you gifts if I come out to your area to speak uh, we can perhaps meet up do dinner lunch or whatever um, so we just want to again thank everybody who supports us on Patreon and please uh, prayerfully consider if you want to support our family and our mission that way so welcome to the show, guys. Thanks for coming on. Hey, great to be with you, friend. Yeah, how's the us. How's the family? Doing great, man. It's been wild, but back to school. I was made for vacation. I was made for summer, I'm pretty sure. So uh, it's always wild to get back into the flow of things. But we have Avila. She is three, three months, months right now. So it's been really cool to watch the family rally around her, and it's been really beautiful and it brings out a different kind of love, man. Even my high school boys can't pass by without picking her up and loving on her. So it's awesome. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, you see a lot of these parents just celebrating, oh, summer's over, get those kids back in school. Like, I can come to the opposite. I'm like, oh, man, it's over. You know, it's, it feels like summer for me, too. So, but yeah, we love it. I love summer. We love summer. Yeah, and I, and I wanted to have you on the show because uh, you guys just came out with this awesome new book, Gift and Grit. <laughs> Uh, tell me about this thing. Like, what, what, what was the? I know, I know. As having written books, there's always they say necessity is the mother of invention. You feel like there's that mm -hmm. that need there. Um, where did this thing come from? Ah, uh, great question. Yeah, I mean, uh, lots of sources. But you know, in, uh, as we mentioned in the book, in spring of 2018, we taught in the Benedictine program in Florence, Italy, and you know, we had 48 students over there. And you know, I mean, I, I we get to know students really well. I teach, you know, we have them over the house and stuff like that. But like, we were living with them every meal trips and got to see, you know, kind of really up close. And obviously, since, you know, COVID, all kinds of things. And, and what was you know, we really kind of saw, uh, I mean, this book's about relationships, but it's also at a deeper level about human formation, about the, getting the human dysfunction right, and, and really getting serious about a life of virtue. And that's kind of where it came from. So many people live without meaning and purpose and life's like a, a story with no plot. And, um, mm -hmm. but then even if you're enthusiastic, I, yeah, I want to, I want to live the Christian life, but do I have what it takes to do that day in day out and sustain that over the long mm -hmm. haul over a vocation, uh, whether it's religious or married or what have you. And so, uh, yeah. someone described it recently the, the book as uh, the Bible of human formation. And I'm mm -hmm. like, man, you, you, you got your finger on what we were after yeah. and how that transforms all your relationships. Uh, from that point we, we've been telling people they're like how long did it take you to write and we were like uh, 20 years about 20 yeah. years um because it, it really is the book you know a lot of people have asked me questions like follow-up questions to emotional virtue we've been doing ministry together since we were you know out of college and so this book is the practicals the stories the 
gosh, I mean, we have chapters like, can men and women be friends? I think we get asked that all the time. The answer is yes. You can go, go read about it. You know, um, breakups. How do you get through a breakup when you keep looking back? Um, that's another chapter. What does sex have to do with the spiritual life? Um, so just a lot of things that we have been mulling over, but also a lot of the questions we've been answering for years. And it, it kind of was one of those, man, I think it's time to put this all somewhere. Yeah. Um, kind of like emotional virtue. You, you're the one that pushed me and said, Sarah, you cannot be everywhere and you have to get this, you know, out so other people you know, that aren't with you can have it. And that's how we felt about this book. We wish we could have everyone over to our house and gather around the island and like talk, but because that isn't possible, we would love that. This is kind of a way for people to get around the island and use this book and talk about things. And so it's very real. It's very practical. Uh, and we really wanted it to just be helpful during this unbelievable hard time for people in the church, not only young adults, but just everyone in general. Yeah. And I still remember the day of the origin of emotional virtue. I don't even know if I told you I was, uh, I was in living in Denver, uh, watching EWTN and you came on and uh, I don't know if you're on life on the rock or what it was. And you were talking yeah. about emotional virtue. And I was like, it just made so much sense of just, you're talking about like the dumb things to do in relationships. Like, oh yeah, like I've done that and I've done that. Oh my goodness, like that. Like, but it was stuff that, I, I don't know, we kind of needed a woman to call us out on in a sense of things that kind of flew under our radar of just like, yeah, I guess, huh, I, I could have been a little more clear with that and I could have done this differently in relationships. So, you know, that's when I reached out to you. I'm like, dude, you gotta write a book. And I'm like, I'm not a writer. I'm like, I didn't ask if you're a writer. You need to write a book. <laughs> yeah. So, so that, know, that, yeah. that was the origin of emotional virtue, which is just pure gold. So, yeah, but, but, I, owe, I owe so much to you pushing me. I remember you saying, who cares? I was like, dude, I have three little kids. It's going to take like 10 years. And you're like, then it takes 10 years. Who cares? Just start doing it. Uh, but I really do. I owe you so much, Jason, for, for pushing me, for believing in me. It really, it really meant a lot. And I, I think the book has really blessed people. And that's what we wanted to have this book do is just to make you pe people feel like they're not alone. They're not crazy. Uh, you know, and that's what people are feeling right now is alone, isolated. They're, you know, scared. They don't know what to do practically, how to take that next step with the Lord, go all in with the Lord. And that's what we tried to do in Gift and Grit was take another step, you know? Yeah. Now d define the title. And then when I want to dive into some of the chapters. Sure. Yeah, but we were working with uh, meaning and grit for a while, and uh, it's you know we've got the line from Rossinger, then you know then Cardinal Rossinger that meaning that's self-made is no meaning at all. Like what we long for is meaning that we receive. It's not simply my own making, my own fabrication, my own you know kind of plotting, but uh, to receive my life as a gift from the Lord, and then to make my life a gift in mm -hmm. return. And so that's where the gift part's coming from. Is real real meaning is received from the Lord, but then. You know, with um, this, with any walk of life, anything you're, you you have the enthusiastic, I I, I want to do this, but then you get into the, the nitty gritty, the brass tacks, and it's like, mm -hmm. oh, this is not as convenient as glamorous as, as I once <laughs> thought it was, and yeah, you know, the temptation to throw in the towel, and and so do yeah. I have the grit to see it through to the end, and and grit not just in like a secular uh, sense, not just white knuckle it, but like that real kind of heroic supernatural grit informed by faith that sees my life as really a self offering to the Lord and. Uh, to you know, kind of remain in the the, the post the Lord has stationed me and mm -hmm. and see it through to the end. Yeah, yeah. the monks that were at Benedictine College were hiding in Andy's office because our house is too loud. Um, and there is right behind me is the Abbey, uh, where the you know our monastic congregation they hang out there, you know, at, at this beautiful place. But the Benedictines take a vow of stability. Uh, it's an extra vow that they take, and it and the the vow is kind of summed up as God is not elsewhere. And we felt that when we were writing this book is a lot of people are like, I'll be happy if and when I, you know, I, I, if I could just achieve this, if I could just, you know, our, our department, Jason, if I could just find this person, they could be my everything. They'll take away all my pain. They'll heal all my wounds. And they're looking for this person or they're looking for this opportunity or what, what have you. And then they'll be happy. Um, and it's really hard for, for a lot of people. They feel like they have to manipulate the situation. They have to earn it. They have to be enough. They have to you know, do all these things. And, and the idea of your life is a gift. The goal of your life is to give it away as a gift. And do you have the grit to do that? Because it's not easy. I mean, it's, yeah. it's gritty to even want to heal from a breakup. It's gritty to want to grow in virtue. It's, it's gritty to be a young mom or a young dad and, and realize that radical loss of freedom that I know I, I was like, what is going on? You know, there, there, know. that was grit. You had to just, you know, really get through that, whether, whether it's a tough time or a time where you're, you're, you're surprised by what God has put in front of you. And you're like, are you sure God here now this, yeah. like Swap said, stay your post, you know? Yeah. No, well, let's dive into some of it. So the first thing you brought up, men and women, can you actually 
be friends. Can you, <laughs> how does that work? You know, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and, and what situations should you not be friends? You know, and, right. and what, what, right. you know, you dive into that a little bit for us. Yeah, we actually wrote in the book, please do not skip ahead to this chapter because everyone is going to just <laughs> yeah. like go to chapter eight, you know? Uh, well, I'm so glad we have four hours to talk about yeah. men and women to be friends. So, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a good one. Well, it seems like there's two extremes, right? There's the uh, let's stay apart because, you know, men and women can't look at each other in anything but sexual objects. And so for purity's sake, let's just miles apart. Or, you know, men and women, there's no differences at all. So let's just, you know, I can have my best friend. You know, it just, just doesn't matter at all. And it's like both are kind of foolish. So I, I, what we you know, really explain and draw from JP2 is, yes, they can be friends. Absolutely. Uh, to and say, you need it. I mean, to say otherwise is to, to reduce us to mere sexual robots. Yeah. But that those friendships are going to be different than same-sex friendships, yes. I mean, so let's not be naive. These are going to be different, have different pitfalls, different potential problems but also challenge us to love in unique ways. And, and I think our formation will be diminished if we don't have those friendships, but we also can't be naive that, um, you know, how those friendships can need to be, you know, um, lived out in a healthy way. So, I mean, I, you know, the, when is it not a good idea? I mean, uh, we've been dating for two years and we're breaking up, but you know, let's be friends. And by that, we mean not just goodwill, but like, let's, let's chat, you know, every other day. And like, you know, I mean, and like, let's, you can't be nice. So you can have goodwill for someone and you can, you might see them again somewhere else and you want to like hear how they're doing, but you can't act like you're still together. Right. So there's maybe a classic example of like, yeah. you need some time, some closure to adjust to the new reality that you're no longer together and you can't emotionally rely on each other mm -hmm. in the same way. The, the term that we were using and we've been using for the last couple of years that we were like, this has to go somewhere and it went in the book. And I, I, that chapter was really hard to write because there's so many subjective scenarios, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, people want to find a pitfall for, or like, oh, I'm different. So, you know, I don't fit in this box. And it's like, yeah, that makes sense. But one of the things we tell people a lot is if you're single, meaning you're not married, you're not religious, you're single, and you might be called to marriage or you're, you know, you're living a, a single life and you're friends with other people who are also single, then there's kind of an element of what we call friends in motion. So what does that mean? It means it's not beyond like all imagination that you might not date one of these people. So, so to be like, oh, we're just friends. We're just friends. That, there's, you can't say that someone isn't going to fall in love with the other one, even if you like don't see that person like that at all. So kind of giving people that idea of like, okay, hey, this is, this is a thing. Like you, if you're not vocationed, then there is that friends in motion. You're moving forward or back from different people in, a, in, in kind of a romantic way because there is the seedbed for that. Um, we, we got, we walked in, you'll love this story, Jason. Cause I, I remember thinking about you. We walked into the Mexican restaurant on our date night here in Atchison. And there was a couple sitting at the table, a guy and a girl, and that we knew both of them. And we were like, you know, we were, we did the whole like elbow each other. Like, Oh my gosh, like, are they going to date? That's like, Oh, they're awesome together. Like we kind of said that. So we went over to say hi, sat down with them and we started chatting and I was like, so are you guys dating? Like, this is awesome. And, and the girl goes, Oh no, no, no. We're just on a freight. And I said, freight. I'm, I'm, sorry, what's a freight? I'm sorry, a freight. And they're like, yeah, like friend date. We freight every week. And I'm like, oh, so how long have you been freighting? And because and, I looked at Andy and I was like, what in the world? And he's like, she's like, oh, like we had been freight for like six months, seven months or something. Like we, we're not inter interested in each other, but we love well, like going on dates and stuff. And, and so we, you know, Bob and I, we hear these things, we see these things. I'm like, man, nothing surprises me anymore. Cause again, two yeah. really great, awesome people who we're not interested in each other. You know, we're not interested in each other. I'm like, oh, okay. But like, you're such good friends. That's awesome. But how, I mean, how do you know that this couldn't be going somewhere? Yeah. So I think, I think we, you know, this chapter was hard to write yeah. because it's like some people really, you do just need to be friends and learn to be friends and know yeah. how to say like, Hey, like, I want to be your friend. I'm not interested in you romantically, but I love hanging out with you know our big group. Thanks so much for, you know, when a guy like, or a girl states their intentions, it's okay to say, oh, I just see you as a friend, but thank you so much, you know? Yeah. And then that other reality, the other extreme of we're quasi dating, but we're not calling it that. And yeah. who is going to call it that? And and have we defined this? Well, we've even defined it as something as a freight, which I, again, I didn't know that term. So 
just trying to get our heads around all this and be able to help mentor and be able to walk with people because this is so messy. It is so messy out there. And this is just a great example of, of some of the hardships that, that our young adults and adults are, are witnessing dating right now. Yeah, I, I mean, I can imagine the challenge of that because, okay, let's say you freight someone for six months. Odds are someone possibly is going to get some feelings for the other. And then you're thinking, okay, am I the only one who's having feelings here? Do I bring up, hey, I'm having feelings for you, and then that's going to ruin the freight? What if they're not mutual? It's like, I don't know. I mean, I, right. I just see that being fraught with potential communication issues when it's just hard to know yeah. when do we even bring up one or more. Right. Well, and the, the litmus test, I think, for me is, okay, so would these activities we're doing, the conversations we're having, Text, All of that, we're sharing. would that be appropriate if either one of us were seriously dating someone else? Mm -hmm. um, if the answer is no, then you're not, ju you're not you're just, just friends. Dating, yeah. Yeah. You're not just friends. You're more than friends. So let's, let's, the, let's just be honest and call it what it is. The other yeah. thing I would say for anybody out there that's like, oh, shoot, she's describing my life. Um, for anybody <laughs> out there that's in this kind of a thing, one of the things I hear a lot, and this is typically, I, I love doing ministry, men's ministry, and I hear a lot of guys will come to me and say, yeah, there's this girl I'm really interested in, but she's really good friends with the other guy. And so I, I can't be, I can't approach her because yeah. I don't want to make him mad. It's like, well, the, how is everyone supposed to know you're just on a freight and not on a date? And how's everyone supposed yeah. to know that you're available when you're spending all this time with this, yeah. this one person? So it's just messy upon messy. And so we try to write about those practical things in the book of how do you get in and out of these things and, yeah. and, and how do you navigate this? It's really wild. Well, I gotta say yeah. one more thing. Like people will say, well, we don't want to lose our friendships. So they're afraid to like take that romantic step and acknowledge their intentions. And one thing we've said to students is like, you know, this friendship can't stay as it is forever. Like yeah. life is going to stick these out because let's say one of the two of you get married to someone else. Like it's not going to stay like this. You're not going to like be married to this person and freight with that person. Right. So yeah. when you really think about that way and you're in that kind of situation and, and you really value this person and you think you like this person, like you've got so much to gain by testing the waters romantically. Oh, yeah. And so little to lose because this yeah. friendship cannot stay like this forever. Yeah. No, I mean, it's a great point because essentially this idea that, oh, it's going to ruin it. It's like, no, you have an opportunity to put a golden frame around this thing. You know, like, <laughs> right. Here's your friendship and then here's marriage framing yeah. what you've got. Well, and I do, I do wonder if some of them don't know that this is the seed bed for great marriages. I think sometimes yeah. social media has really distorted this. I think, you know, there's just a lot of where they're like, well, I'm going to marry this person, but I'm really good friends with this person. And I'm like, yeah, that could be the same person, but they almost don't give it a chance. We talked a lot in the book about when to be picky and when not to be like how what is too picky. We actually wrote about that because we get that question all the time. So yeah. it's loaded with a lot of those kind of like branching out like this question, that question. And a lot of things that we hear people talking about and asking us about, which is yeah. And, and one of the common issues I've heard, particularly among the women, is that he doesn't want to be friends with me because I'm not interested in dating him. So it's like friendship almost becomes a tool to find a date. And you know, if they're not, yeah. if they're not, you know, available or interested, well, then, psh, well, there's no point in even being a friend with you. And I imagine you probably see that on campus plenty. Too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really messy because you have that side and then you have, I had a guy come up to me one time and be like, why would I like be friends with a girl if I wasn't going to sleep with her? Like, why would I be friends with a girl if I wasn't going to like date her? Like, what's the point? And I'm like, yeah. so this is why the chapter called Can Men and Women Be Friends needs to be written and has to be written very delicately. I think we, we re, I mean, we wrote the book and it's very hard to co-write books because we're like, we're so different and yet so the same. So I think we had eight different versions of the book where we wrote it, read it, rewrote it, read it. Yeah. And this, this chapter was one of the hardest ones because it could oh, be sure. a whole book. I mean, it could be a whole book, but trying to narrow down to like, man, there's so many scenarios that, that can be really hard. Yeah. And, and Andrew, you had mentioned some of the pitfalls, uh, you know, in terms of male, female relationships. Do you want to cover right. any of those? Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, we kind of take our cue from JP2 and his book, Love and Responsibility, but just the differences between men and women. And, and on the one hand, like men are not just sex robots and women are not just bundles of emotions. Mm -hmm. uh, we both have both, right? Men have emotions, women have sexual desires. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the language JP2 uses, well, men tend to be stronger in the sensuality and women tend to be stronger in their sentimentality or the affective and the emotional. And, and there's exceptions across the board, but mm -hmm. those tendencies are real enough that we do well to kind of be aware of them. And so I think for the guys to look at the women as, as simply kind of potential sexual objects and, and like I'm, I'm being friends with you as a means to an end for the women, Huge they might look ball. to male friends as sort of 
that emotional gratification that a boyfriend might provide, but I, I don't have the strings attached. And um, so I, I think just not being naive that we are we are the same in many ways, but we're also different, different in terms of tendencies and, and, and potential pitfalls. Mm -hmm. And just to kind of be aware of that dynamic. And um, I think that, you know, when I think about men and women being just friends, I mean, I think in reality, like, that only tends to happen. I think in some ways it's easier, as you mentioned, when mm -hmm. vocations are settled. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when, when I, if I'm friends with a woman, it's important that she's also friends with my wife. Mm -hmm. And, and it, you know, the things are very clear and there's no like, you know, um, mixed motives or mixed incentives or mixed messages that are being sent. Um, but I think when you don't, and even that, you still have to be careful, right? A religious, mm -hmm. same thing. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I think the only way that you, if there's a two people who, they have mutually acknowledged there is no future between us. Like there's no, like, and that's almost like explicit. I think that's the only way you really approximate this just friendship. Otherwise, without that, I think you have to just not be naive to think, hey, it's possible this could turn into something. It's possible that trash could develop. It's all these things are possible. And let's just not be naive. Let's not be paranoid, but yeah. let's not be naive. Well, yeah. and also we're huge, huge fans of hanging out in groups. Because I always tell people, like, if you have a group of guys and a group of girls and you guys go out and hang out, you know, we used to always go cosmic bowling. That was like our thing in college. We would go out and, go, and then we go cosmic bowling Saturday night. It was really fun. And then we loser guys against girls. Loser would pay for IHOP afterwards. And we'd all go and go out for breakfast afterwards. It was super fun. But I used to tell people I could learn more about a guy I was interested in in that group on that Saturday night when he's yeah. with all those other girls and all those other guys. You learn more about someone in that atmosphere than you ever would on one blind date. They can be yeah. whoever they want to be for three and a half hours. So I, we always say it's really hard, you know, like it, unless you're in a vocation and like we have a lot of friends that are couples that, you know, we have friends that are priests. Or, you know, it's great whenever you already have like, OK, we got this all established. But man, when you have a group of, of adults or young adults that are all single, I, I think it's just knowing, okay, I, this is, there is potential in here. Don't be naive and don't be paranoid. I think those are the two, I think Andy hit it right on the head. It's just live your life, look, be aware. The other thing we love is in person hanging out. You pick up on those social cues. You pick up on those. I had some guys tell me like, can you give a talk on how to flirt again? Cause I am lost. You know, like a lot of guys are like, I forgot like, whether it was post COVID or just they never how learned. To flirt as a Catholic. How to flirt as like, yeah, yeah like, converted to talk, yes. Right? And we talk about this in the book, you know, like uh, dropping hints and what, you know, a lot of women are like, I, I, I forgot how to like show someone I'm interested. You know what I mean? So yeah. we, we talked about that even in the book and friend, like we talked about how to make a friend 101 and how to pursue someone 101. Cause both of those things are so assumed. And I keep joking with people. I'm like, uh, guys, we're not like our grandparents where they literally went to a Knights of Columbus dance and came back with a spouse. So yeah. this is just not where we're at anymore. It's really difficult. And I feel, we both feel so deeply for these young adults and adults that are dating right now. It is brutal. It's brutal right now. And it's so confusing and hard. And that was a, a, one of the main motivations of we got to write this book now because it's not getting easier. It's definitely not getting easier to have friendships and relationships. Yeah, and in terms of the the kind of the obstacles of forming and finding these relationships, you mentioned in the book the the wounds of men and women are different. Uh, could could you maybe speak to the wounds of one gender or the other in terms of okay, what are some particular ways that men need to be aware of the woundedness of women, women aware of the woundedness of men, so they can kind of come into these relationships with both eyes wide open. Mm. Great question. Gosh, yeah. Uh, I mean, great, great question. And, and, <laughs> Another four hours well, would be great, yeah, Jason. Yeah. And it's like, that. Well, and you don't want to, you, you want to be careful with stereotypes, yeah. right? But they're also, they tend to like arise for a reason, right? So, mm. uh, so what, what do I mean? Um, you know, stereotype, it's, it's, it's said that the, the way to, you know, a, a woman's heart or a female pornography, which is a real thing and is, and is, is beset so many people in the intense shame that's there because they're like, I'm struggling with like the guy problem. Like that's false. Mm -hmm. It affects all of us. But what I was getting at is the way to a woman's, you know, a heart is through her ear. Right. And, and, and with, with a guy, it's often visual. Right. And so what wounds might, uh, with a woman, you're very often like there's, and we've all had this, but mother wounds, father wounds, um, just insecurities. And so what can a guy potentially do? He might just butter up someone with compliments and, and, and sort of like all of a sudden he's like saying the right things. He's pushing the right emotional buttons and it's creating kind of a, a you know, a sense of intimacy between the two. And if you're not careful and if you're not sincere, like this is going to go nowhere good fast. Um, and it, you know, for a guy, I mean, it's, um, you know, 
it's sad, but it, it, there's something to it. We talk about modesty. Guys can be immodest. Guys can take their shirt off when they don't need to. Guys can wear shirts that are too tight. Mm-hmm. But there's a sense in which this, you know, for women and, 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 and not just dress, but how one acts, how one carries themselves. Um, often a guy might take something in a sensual direction that a woman doesn't intend that or doesn't realize that or isn't even aware of. And what, you know, whose fault is it? Well, I'm not asking that, but if a guy has been stuck in pornography since he was 10 years old, I mean, all kinds of things that are going to, you know, make each of us prone to use each other in, in, in ways that happen all too easily, um, kind of artificially step into each other's wounds and build each other up, maybe in ways that aren't sincere and authentic and just kind of create this. It's almost like, I mean, I think the danger is we've all heard friends with benefits um, in, in the secular hookup culture. But, you know, are there like kind of Catholic analogs to that that, you know, maybe aren't as extreme, but 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 are flirt with dangers and maybe can actually go to the same place if we're not careful? I mean, the body's going to follow the heart. Mm-hmm. So if we're not careful, um, those things are right around the corner. Yeah. And I think I would just add, you know, we in the book, we talked about um, our wounds and why this is going to be difficult, because I think, you know, Jason, you're like the master at being able to come in and, and tell people like this is what this is what's wrong. This is why you hurt. And this is how I like. I, this is how I want to help you get out of this. This is how we want you to heal. I think all of us, you know, that do these ministries, it's it is a healing ministry. Like, period. That's all it is. And so when you when you kind of show people, you know, this is the way we can hurt each other. This is the way we're already insecure and probably looking for that affirmation. You know, I we talked about our own wounds a lot in the book. We we get very very particular. Very. And there was a couple of times where I was like, "Are we really telling this story? Like, am I really putting this in print?" But it's like it's so much easier to say it to someone you're you're with, you know, one on one. But I'm like, why am I saving this for a one on one? Like, I, I gotta just I gotta say it. It was like, how do we replicate what happens in our a kitchen island yeah or book. even standing and talking to people after talks you know that's where i i get all these questions and i'm like whoa this is what okay this is this is it this is the new thing and so i think the one thing we i want to say to the wounded the woundedness is um it's just the insecurities and the anxieties and the feelings of isolation the feelings of, of fear all of those are so real and i i remember when i started having my conversion i started running around like with a different group of girls different group of guys i started seeing this I remember looking across at the group of guys I was hanging out with for the first time and I was like, man, I will never understand their battle, but like, I don't want to be an obstacle to their holiness. Like, I don't want to be an obstacle anymore. I don't want to use them emotionally, physically. I don't, I don't want them to, to live their life having to be an affirmation piece for me because I'm so insecure. Like I want to live my life with Jesus Christ at the center of my life. And I want that. I want him and that for all of us. And so I think that that was one thing that we talked later in the book. We talked a lot about just what does it look like to have that freedom to be like a confident, beloved daughter of God, son of God, and not feel like we have to wound others in order to help mask our own wounds. Yeah, no, a lot, a lot of what you just said reminded me of a conversation I just had uh, with this past trip. I went out to get, do some chastity talks, and during one of the talks, I had mentioned that uh, I met a high school football player, and, and after the talk, he came to me and said that you know he is sexually active. But he, he wants to be a better man. And so he said, I, this is what I did. And he, he showed me a piece of paper filled front and back with his handwriting. And all it said at the top, across the top was 100 ways to start loving Kelsey without having sex. And then he emailed me three days later. He said, I'm almost done with 100. I'm going to make it 1,000. Thanks. This is going to make a difference. And so I mentioned that at the talk. <laughs> so and then a girl comes up after the talk with two of her girlfriends. And she's in tears. And she just hands me her cell phone. She's like, can you read this? And so she sends me this huge, gives me this huge thread of a conversation through text that she had with her boyfriend as soon as the assembly ended. She texted him, she's like, can you just text me just a hundred things you like about me or love about me? And he texts her back, he's like, why? And she's like, well, can you just do it? And he's like, why are you making me do this? And they got in this huge fight and there's expletives. You know, I'm going through this thing. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and I asked her, I'm like, do, do, you, do you think you're going to marry this guy? And she just was like, Pah, no. And I'm like, what are you doing on the train if you're not going to Cleveland? And, you know, but she was just <laughs> right. heartbroken because it was like pulling teeth to get this guy to say what he loved about her. And I and, and as we were leaving, I mean, we had a great chat and she decided, OK, this, this needs to end. And God willing, she ended it. I said, look, one of the last things I said to her is that, that when, when this is real love, when the real thing comes and the right guy comes, you're not going to have to ask him or beg him for the list. He's just going to give it to you. These things would come yeah. naturally. And so for a girl like that, yeah. who's clearly settling 
but wondering if she's being too picky. Can you help sift through that for these people that think, oh my goodness, you know, am I too picky because I want them not to look at porn? Am I too picky? It's like, dude, that's not picky. That's like saying, am I picky for wanting tires on a car that they sell me? You know, like that's not an upgrade. Yeah. This is a standard feature. So help the listeners yeah. right now to kind of go this through. This is power window. This yeah. Is power window. You know, so let, let's hear, let's hear what is standards, what is too picky? Well, I think before when you were talking, um, my line that I tell a lot of men and women is if you're dating someone that you can't see yourself marrying, you're not dating them, you're dating heartache. Mm. Like that's what you're dating. Yeah. And a lot of times I say that and you can just see like the room is just jarred. And I'm yeah, like, you know a, a, that I'm a priest. Right. Our priest just gave a homily recently, and he, he said, ask yourself, are you chasing a dream or are you chasing a nightmare? Oh. oh. Yeah, zing. Or are you not chasing reality? Like, I think that's one yeah, thing that, yeah. that they, they really dream up these people that do not exist. Yeah. And so, I mean, you're hitting it right on the head. And I think your question of, of yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's like everything. There, that's a bloated question. Well, they need to be honest. Uh, you need to fall in love with the ideal of what you think they might be someday or could be or what they, you think they are in your head, but that may not be the same as what they actually are. So I, things like faith and character, non-negotiable, right? So do not, do not settle there. Do not lower your standards there. Um, you, you're, you'll never regret holding the rope there. Mm -hmm. The two picky thing we see is things like, you know, well, she doesn't listen to the same podcast as I do, or <laughs> he's not a Cardinals fan. It's like, or are they just, Guys, I, I think the big thing I'm is, an inch taller than him. Yeah, or, okay. Like, Flats for life. It's fine. Right. Like, be open to God <laughs> surprising. I think that this happens with friends and also in romantic yeah. couples. So like, yeah, you, you might have, I mean, we see this, like, you know, look at the apostles. Like there's no way Simon the zealot should be hanging with Matthew the tax collector. Like, <laughs> but they're so different, but rooted in Christ, all of a sudden there's something more. Mm -hmm. And that happens sometimes with friendships with like, man, I, you know, my previous life, I would never hung out with you, but you know, there's something deeper here and you challenge yeah. me in unique ways. And I think the same thing in dating, they might not be your, now on the one hand, let me be clear, attraction is essential. Attraction is essential. One more time. Attraction, <laughs> attraction is, essential. is essential. I thought that was superficial. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> chemistry but, is a great thing but they might not be your your type at first and something might something deeper might really grow over time or develop you know Bortillo has got this great line in love possibility where he says he speaks about the the sexual attraction and even the like the hyper emotional connection as, as the raw materials for love mm -hmm. um and, and that sometimes sometimes you can have a great high concentration of, of the raw materials for love and it just gets consumed in the utilitarian dimension it just fizzles out right away and i have my notes i wrote my book Hollywood. And then he say, goes on to say, sometimes you might have very modest raw materials that might give rise to a truly great love. And I wrote in the margin, your grandparents, right? <laughs> and, and we just have to be open to like the way in which the Lord might work here. So faith and character, non-negotiable. Um, part of why you date, I mean, when we started dating, I knew from day one, because we were already friends, I knew she was the kind of person I wanted to end up with, mm -hmm. but I didn't know if it was her, right? Yeah. And that's part of why you date is, okay, you got the objective things, the faith and the character. She's that kind of person. Okay, now do we click? How is the chemistry between the two of us? How is so the attraction, the chemistry? That's also essential within that objective framework. But I, we have seen again and again where people are too picky for the wrong reasons. So it, it's not the pornography. Like, absolutely, do not buckle on that. Do not. I mean, not even. Think of pornography as cheating, friends. I mean, like, mm -hmm. this is not like just a game, right? Mm -hmm. um, you want to marry a man, not a boy, mm -hmm. uh, and, and vice mm -hmm. versa on the other side as well. Um, so, yeah, faith and character, non-negotiable. Attraction, easy, essential. But be open to the fact that some attractions can develop more slowly than others. And so be open to God surprising you. I also think, last thing, I think that social media has really messed with a lot of people, guy and girl, on this because they make assumptions number one, um, based on, they, they think they already have the person figured out or they know who that person is and they don't give them a chance in person. And then I think the number two, uh, I, I just, I really worry about this generation because I think a lot of times they've dreamt up their life. They, they've, they've almost like Pinterest boarded it. They mood boarded their life. So they have this guy or this girl that they, they are looking for and they're not open at all to God surprising them or them being any different than this thing that they've obsessed about, that they've, I mean, the word I just was not, uh, concocted, manipulated. And you are, I, I mean, this is part of my testimony. You know, a priest told me in confession, like, 
Like, Sarah, you're looking for all these guys to be your savior. And, you, you, Sarah, you don't need them to be your savior because you already have one. But we, what you're doing, Sarah, is you're putting all this pressure on and weight on these guys. And they, you're crushing them. And they're never going to be able to be perfect for you. They're never going to be your everything. And, and, and then this priest looked at me. He goes, and if you will continue to do this, you will always be disappointed. Hmm. And I was in college, and I remember just being like, oh, my gosh. Like, in the confessional, I always say when people tell you priests don't know what's up, you know, you just drop kick them out of the room because it was it was literally the most mic drop moment in my life. And I, I share this in my testimony, and I watch people's faces go, oh, my gosh. Like, I literally have wrote my life out to a T. I have my wedding planned. I have – that's mostly the girls – but the guys are even like, I, you know, I have this girl in my head. I have this woman in my head. And I'm just looking for her. And it's like, okay, you, you have this list of things that are important to you, but you haven't even asked God, like, what you should be. You know, you, you haven't consulted our Lord, and, you, and you're not open to being surprised. Yeah. And I, I think, Jason, I think you could attest to this. I, so many of my friends that are married, I was surprised by this. I, I thought I was going to marry someone who was like, a great dancer and like super outgoing. I didn't super make him a dancing part. <laughs> dude, the dude can't wink. The dude can't whistle. The dude, he can't dance. Like all the things. Like, it, but but look at me. Like I, when I started, when we started dating, I was like, this man's not afraid to die. Like he wants to be a freaking martyr. And like I was so attracted to that. I was like, I need someone to to like run with me to heaven. I can dance. I can dance on the dance floor at a wedding with anybody. You know what I mean? Like I need someone to like take me where I can't go. And it was the best decision of my life. We have such great chemistry. We have such we have so much fun. We have, as C.S. Lewis would say, the same telos. We're going to the same place. And it makes our marriage fun and alive. And we love it. We love doing ministry together. We love raising kids together. It's so fun. And, it, and marriage is so hard that I just beg and plead all of everyone out there that's watching this. Like, be open to God surprising you. And maybe take your list of what you thought you wanted and maybe just, like, you know, I don't know, bury it for a little bit. We can dig it up like a year from now and look at it again. But, you know, I, I had a woman one time say that she takes her whole wardrobe. And if she hasn't worn anything in six months, she puts it in a trash bag and she puts it in the trunk of her car. And if she doesn't reach for it over a month, she takes it straight to the thrift store and gives it away. And I was like, I think that's sometimes what we need to do with our like with our wants and, and hopes and dreams. And it's like we're so like just we have to have it. We're so obsessed and connected or these goals and these dreams. And they're all so good. But sometimes I think we need to take those lists and take those desires and give them to the Lord and say, I just want to live my life. And you're going to bring to the surface what I'm supposed to be doing. You're going to you're going to uh, like, you know, avert my gaze to where you want me to go. And I, I just really challenge people that. Don't be afraid of being surprised. They might not look exactly what you thought they were going to look like. And that is a beautiful thing if you're praying and trusting the Lord. Now, I can imagine someone listening to all this and be like, okay, I'm, I'm getting this. I'm following you. Um, non-negotiable is faith. But where is it non-negotiable? Like, okay, I met this guy and he was baptized Catholic and he's open to going to church or he goes to church, but he has questions about the faith or he's super devout, right. but he's Baptist. But he reads the Bible every right. day. He loves God. He's a prayer warrior, but he's not interested in joining <laughs> the Catholic Church. Like, there's all these potential scenarios where faith is present, but it's not what you had wanted. Like, well, I want this devout, card-carrying, daily mass Catholic, you know, and maybe God wants that for you. But, but how do you know when to say, okay, your faith isn't enough of a match with my faith? Because, I mean, I know devout Catholic marriages that are an absolute dumpster fire. And then I know ones where it's a Catholic and a Protestant, very harmonious and beautiful. And so maybe some discernment tips there in terms of the non-negotiability of faith, how to actually apply that on the real life situations. Gosh, Jason, Jason it sounds like you've had this question before. Um, <laughs> I feel like we get this question all the time, and that was very beautifully put. And no, we get this question a lot. You're spot on, and there, there's probably not one answer. No, um, no, I, 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 but – um, I think you got to really ask yourself, and this is, it, it's, it's hard. There's a lot of, I mean, let's, let's be honest about how hard this is. Cause like, okay, not only do I want to, for a lot of us, marry a Catholic, but it's going to be the right kind of Catholic. Mm -hmm. and especially today, things are so often polarized and tribalistic. And, and so I think, um, things that I would not do, frankly, and I, this, this might, you know, uh, bother some people, but like, 
you know, they might not have the same spirituality as you, right? They might, um, they might not be, you know, a traditional Latin mass or they, I mean, like, like be open to differences. And even with your own kids, like my kids don't all have the same spirituality. I got one that will pray the rosary on his own and do the demand for consecration on his own. I got another one that jams out the Christian rap and that's his best meditation, right? I mean, so, <laughs> and there's a need to like kind of be comfortable with some healthy diversity. Um, but I think to the, the key to your, your real question, though, is I think you've, you've got to ask yourself, and the question this, that we bring is, do I trust this person with my kids? And do I trust this person to be the primary formative influence over my kids if I'm not there? Let's say I die in a car accident. Let's say I'm gone. Because it's easy to be like when we're dating, oh, we can work this out. Or I'll always be there to balance things out. Yeah. But I think you, you've struck gold when you say, you know, if I'm gone, I would love to entrust my kids to this person. Mm-hmm. And, and it's so can a Catholic marry a non Catholic, a non Catholic Christian? Well, of course they can. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and it happens, and it, it's even sacramentally valid if you have two baptized Christians. Um, but I think don't be naive to the challenges that may be on your way. Because when you talk about, ra- I mean, raising kids is hard enough. Mm. I couldn't, I couldn't imagine two things. I couldn't imagine not being on the exact same page in terms of faith formation and moral formation. Mm-hmm as we try to pass this on and counsel our kids. And then also like, if it, if that's the deepest part of who you are, Mm -hmm. wouldn't you want to be able to share that with your spouse? So I think let's not be naive to think we'll just kind of, it doesn't really matter. Uh, It does matter deeply. doesn't mean it can't work out, but but it does mean there's going to be unique challenges ahead. Mm -hmm. So so I think on on the one hand, don't, don't be so insistent. They have to be the exact same kind of Catholic as you in terms of things that the church does not have a definitive teaching on. Right, mm-hmm. Novus Ordo, Latin Mass, mm-hmm. uh, Rosary, Divine Mercy Chaplet. Like, be <laughs> open. Don't don't be so rigid because right. then you might set yourself up to fail. But don't be so naively loose that like it doesn't really matter as long as they're kind of, in some loose sense, a Christian. Right. Uh, it's going to matter a lot, especially as you get more serious, and especially if when the idea of kids coming along. Father yeah. Mike was talking about this in Catechism in a Year. I was just recently there. He was going through some of this and. It, I kind of was like, whoa, but he said he was talking to a couple. They had been married, I think he said 40 years. They were like in their 60s. And one was Catholic and one was Protestant. And he asked them, he's really just point blank, how was that? Like, how was it and how is it being married all that, all this time and, and having different faiths? And they faiths, and they both looked at each other and said, oh, we wouldn't do it again. We wouldn't marry each other again. And father, father said he was like, okay and they were and they were just very honest and they said they were like yeah it was our kids it was really hard on our kids they felt like they had to side with different parents um you know whether it came to sex or money or the way that we formed our kids the way we we made decisions we came at it at very different angles and it was very hard and i i was i remember just i i I think i was like putting my makeup on listening to gaddy was a year and i was just like wow like i wonder how many people you know there's probably people out there listening that are and i get this question a lot too can I marry someone who's not Catholic? And the answer is, yes, you can. But Father Mike goes, but is it wise? Yeah. And his, his whole thing was just, you know, I, I, I tell this to the, the girls and guys that I, that I come across whenever they ask me this. It's just, you can, but I would be lying to you if I told you that the greatest thing about my life is my faith and that I share it with him mm-hmm. and that he shares his faith with me. Because it, it absolutely underpins and affects every single every single every single thing in my life. Yeah. It's hard there, it's hard to find things that it doesn't touch, mm-hmm. and so it, it's not it's not a no. It's a you have to decide you know really like how how do you want this to go down? Because a lot of times your kids pick the lowest common denominator of both of your faiths. I've had a lot of adult children tell me, yeah, we, I, I'm really not anything because my parents didn't want to be too much of one thing. Hmm. So I've I've had a lot of young adults say, I wish they would have just picked. Yeah. And so it's really hard. I think that's going to be really hard. And so picky, yes, picky, be picky, don't settle. Um, yeah. But I think this conversation, again, it, there's so many variables, but you really have to take it to our Lord and say, what, what is it that I don't want to budge on? And what is it that I can work through and that we can work through? Um, yeah. But it is a really tough question. Now, we've covered quite a bit of uh, dating discernment, but let's move into in a dating relationship or marriage. How does grit you know, infuse life into those relationships in, in the married life and the dating life. Where does grit come into play? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. it reminds me a lot of um, like St. Ignatius Loyola, his, his rules for overcoming desolation, uh, the rule five, where he's like, uh, you know, in a time of desolation, never make a change or never make a spiritual change. Cause that, that's the time of the lie. That's the time of deception. And it's, it's, as we mentioned earlier, it's so easy 
you know, when things um, just aren't as glamorous, like you, it's like you get married and you've got some little kids. It's like, gosh, this isn't, you know, this isn't as, as all that I thought it was going to be. And there's some really hard. And, mm-hmm. um, to, you know, it's, 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 it's marriage is a rich, rich vocation. Like, so on the one hand, like, is it hard? Yeah, but it's, it's a wonderfully rich and, and just blessed vocation. Um, so I'm not trying to give the wrong, the wrong sense. Um, but I think it's, it's having that, I mean, I think virtue becomes heroic when it becomes consistent and you can do it with peace and with joy, uh, not begrudgingly. Even during the hard um, time. So, so the guy that we really look to in the book is Father Walter Chizik, uh, the, the mm-hmm. missionary to communist Russia. Uh, and we could go through his story, but I mean, he ends up in a Siberian prison, you know, uh, communist prison camp for 15 years. And because he trusts in God's providence, he really sees this as this is where the Lord has me. And so my, my mission in life is to kind of embrace this and offer mm-hmm. it back to the Lord as a holy sacrifice and sort of choose what I would never have chosen for myself and even see it mysteriously as gift from the Father. Now, there will be places and times where we need to get ourselves out of situations, situations of abuse or things like that. Right. Absolutely. But there's a lot of times where we're, we felt called to go into this, felt called to get married, mm-hmm. uh, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, I'm just not feeling it. Or it could be a priest or religious, like, you know, I, I know I swore these vows, went through this ordination, and now I'm, not, I'm just not feeling it. Mm-hmm. It's like that's the time of the lie. That's the time mm-hmm. of deception. Um, a mentor said this to me a long time ago. said, be faithful uh, to where the Lord has you. Be faithful to the, force, to the post the Lord has you at. Mm-hmm. And the grit here is really to see our lives in light of faith, to see even the things that maybe we wouldn't have chosen for ourselves that might be kind of burdensome, onerous, or just kind of not as glamorous as I thought it would be, mm-hmm. to see that as sort of a, a gift um, that really I'm called to embrace and offer back as a holy sacrifice. And that's really kind of how we describe a supernatural grit. It's not just I'm going to white knuckle it, but no, I'm going to see the crying baby, or I'm going to see this, this is where the Lord has me. And it's a gift from him that I would never have chosen for myself. And my task here right now is to embrace it and offer it back as a holy sacrifice. And the more we can do that, the more we'll live out even those adverse moments yeah. with joy and with peace and be able to love in and through the midst of that adversity. I think our Lord speaks so much about anxiety and, you know, and there's different kinds of anxiety. But in my own life, when I can't get past my issues, my concerns, my worries, I might be physically in the same room, but I'm not present. And I think to, to rise above that kind of paralysis of our love but to be able to love in the midst of trial and hardship that's where that grit comes in is to kind of see it through sustain it continue it and continue it with peace and with joy yeah i think one of the most attractive things about human beings like when you have whether it's friends or spouses or any of that is selflessness Mm -hmm. and you know it's so easy our world just yells from the from the rooftops like live for yourself like take what you can get ahead like live for you and do whatever makes you happy, whatever makes you comfortable. It's just, it, you know, the relativistic language that is just, it seeps into our, it, it seeps into us, you know? And, you know, one of the, the greatest marriage advice that we always give each other, and it's really hard, that we give people is, and it's really hard, even for us, is don't keep score. It's so easy. I, I used to full, I used to do all the laundry when he, when he was gone, like at work, and I'd have the little kids, and I would like do all the laundry, fold it, put it away, and he'd come home and be like, what'd you do today? And I'd be like, What? Like, so I used to just like leave it out and be like, look what I did today, you know? I mean, cause it's just so, it's so hard. I think as in any stage in life, you know, to just, to, to the daily grind and to, to, it's so easy to want to live for yourself. Like what's in it for me? What's in it for me? And I think that, that grit is really, no matter what vocation you're in, even if you're single, you know, that, that daily grind of, I am going to live for the Lord and I'm not going to live for myself. And it's, it's the great Christian mystery. You know, the world cannot wrap its mind around it. You know, like, you know, why do you have six kids? Like, why, you know, why do you give to the poor? Why do you volunteer? Why do you, why do you do any of the things that you do that don't make sense to the world? And it's just so beautiful because I think then you start hanging out with people who are selfless and gritty and virtuous. And, you know, and you're like, I want that. I want to be that. It's inspiring. And, you know, and it's those little times when no one sees, you know, I, I always see moms at like the grocery store and stuff, you know, and there's like a kid melting and, you know, it's like you just see, and you, you, it's like the Hunger Games thing where you're just like, you know, like, hey, like, I got you, you know, because we're all in this together, but so much of the, the grit is unseen. And you just, you, sometimes it's like, man, that's, it's between you and the Lord. And I think that, that that's really hard. And, and it's really, it's that the book, when we wrote it, I was like, I want people to know, like, this is really where faith takes on, I think, the, the, the most 
this is where the rubber hits the road. I don't know how else to say it. Like, if you can talk a big game and be like, oh, Jesus, he's so great. I love him so much. Like, go team. I'm Catholic. It's so wonderful. But if you're not loving the people within your four walls and you're not, if you're not pleasant to be around and if, if, if when stuff goes down, like Soft said, when stuff goes down, if you just lose it and you can't, you know, function, then that's where grit has to step in. And it's not just grit and bear it. It's be joyful, be, be loving, be patient when everything's going wrong. That is hard. And that's a lifelong thing. That's why this book, a lot of young adults like it, but a lot of adults like it too. Cause you don't graduate from self like selfishness. You're not like, <laughs> Well, finish that feeling super unselfish. Now I'm just never going to struggle with that ever again. Like, yeah. it's not, not true. It's a daily choice. Yeah. And uh, having a prayer life and living for the Lord and having virtue and, and that grittiness of life, um, it's so attractive. Yeah. And it's also so necessary if you want to live this life. I think for our listeners, those who may be in a dating relationship or single in, in discernment, you know, watch how they handle, watch how people handle suffering or stress. Mm-hmm because uh, that's, that's going to that's like. come your way, right? So that, that this is like an important thing to look at. And, you know, on the, like, watch what kind of grit they have. Do they, do they pray? Do they make a commitment to prayer? Like, like non-negotiable. Like, can they make that a priority? And how do they handle suffering and stress? Those are like really important things to kind of watch out for yeah. in terms of, are they the kind of person I want to end up with? Yeah, Will Farrell has this hilarious uh, meme that says, before you get in a relationship with anyone, make sure you watch them with slow internet to know who they truly are. Yeah. <laughs> I laughed so hard. I was like, if that isn't the truth, right? Like, uh, make sure you know how they handle slow internet before you, you dive too deeply. Yeah, no, marriage will be plenty of stress. What advice would you give to someone? Because I know I get a lot of these questions from people that are in relationships where uh, they're gritting it out, they're doing their part, they're busting it. But you had mentioned like, well, sometimes there's cases of abuse. They need to get out of that thing. You know, or I get a lot of emails from wives whose husbands are pretty deep into certain types of addictions or infidelity, and they're wondering, okay, how long do I grind this out? Like, am I am I gritting this out to the detriment of my own children? And is this what the father wants for me? Like, how do I know whether just put your nose to the grindstone and just keep pushing, or is is this thing real to begin with? You know, I I know a lot of people sitting in that tension point of thinking, okay, my holiness is measured by my capacity to absorb suffering eternally. And it's like, okay, is that masochistic or is that, is that a path to holiness or a path to the insane asylum? What, what would you say for people in those situations? Right. Well, I think they need to know there's not one answer. I mean, yeah. the, 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 there may be with a Catholic sacramental, like you may be, you could even be morally obligated to physically separate. Mm-hmm. For the safe, for your own safety, safety of the kids, like that, that, that's, and that's not, that's not a divorce. That, that's, I mean, you, you're, you, this sacramental marriage might still be there, but to physically separate. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think there's a danger of, is there any willingness on the other person's part to change? Like, are you enabling mm-hmm. this to continue because you're, you're skipping out? So on the one hand, I just took students through Augustine's Confessions, and you know, you read about Monica, and she's so heroic. But some of those parts are really hard to read, especially mm-hmm. today, because you've got her husband who's uh, unfaithful and basically Augustine more or less says, yeah, the only reason he didn't beat my mom is because she like was really calculated and how she didn't set him off and how, you, you know, and Augustine's praising her uh. patience, but it's also like, okay, that, that, that might be heroic in Monica's context, but that might not be everybody's call. Mm-hmm. And I think we need to say that and, and, and have discretion and have prudence to step in. Um, so I don't think there's one answer. I think they need to know there's not one answer. Um, and just you're gonna to have to seek counsel and prayer and, mm-hmm. and and i think kind of where is the other person coming from is there any initiative on their part and how long has this been an issue and been brought to bear you know where we were talking about it and there's resistance 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 um so there's no sin in physically separating and mm-hmm. maybe sometimes the wake-up call is what's going to be the catalyst to to fix it i, I don't want to yeah. oversell because we this mm-hmm. may not happen um, but sometimes the status quo, you know, they say, I think it was Einstein, uh, insanity is defined by doing the same thing twice and expecting a different result, right? So um, I don't know the answer, but I think it's important to say there's not one size fits all answer. Yeah. Seek counsel, pray. Um, and our heart goes out um, to yeah, anybody oh, out there. It just breaks, breaks my, heart. my heart. And then also, I think there's, uh, I've counseled this, we've counseled this many times as well. And I think there is a, there, it's great to get a game plan together and be like, I'm going to do this. I need to do this. I need to do this. And then at some point, you have to just say, I've done everything I can. Yeah. Um, and I really love the word boundaries. I know, mm-hmm. you know, just like you have to have boundaries of, yeah. you know, for your kids, for yourself, you know, and 
So I, I, I agree with Andy, you know, there's something really beautiful in, you know, in I'm going to try and make this work. But if you've done everything you can and you've shown that grit, you know, to, to say, I, you know, but there is a point where you have to say, okay, now this is just toxic and this is just harmful and this is just not healthy for me, myself, you know, so having a great spiritual director, mentor, having great friends, having a great priest in your life, um, it, you know, make sure that you have other eyes on this thing and you're not just, yeah. you know, uh, uh, quietly enduring this because that's not, you're not going to be able to do this alone. Yeah. Um, so please, please seek help, you know, uh, in your circle. And if you don't have a circle, find circles, you know, have someone, a priest hook you up with someone that can help you because it's, it is probably, that is probably one of the darkest times for a lot of people is trying to work through something like that. That is just so hard. And, and our heart goes out to people and we're praying for you. Yeah, I heard a parenting quote that could apply to any relationship, I think, that consequences shape behavior. You know, like if, if your kid does X, Y, and Z, and you're like, ah, well, don't worry about it. Well, you just shaped his future behavior versus like, whoa, that is a cardinal offense, and you're going to go, you know, have this consequence. You know, so the consequences are shaping the behavior. So you almost have to discern, okay, what's a reasonable consequence if this type of behavior persists? And then if, I, if I've discerned this is a reasonable consequence, and I don't enact it, and I don't follow through with it, I'm almost complicit in a sense of encouraging the behavior because I'm just putting up with it. I'm almost endorsing it by right. my lack of consequences. So um, right, right. one last question I'll pitch off to you guys before we wrap up um, that applies to married as well as dating and single. Uh, the whole chastity thing you cover in the book is chastity the friend or the foe. And, you know, obviously John Paul does such a beautiful <laughs> job talking about those who look at chastity as the foe, this this resentment toward chastity. But, you know, help the listeners, viewers kind of understand why chastity is a friend to develop often, developing authentic love uh, versus the foe of intimacy. Amen. Yeah. I mean, chastity is only the foe, and this is what John Paul II teaches, he's dead on, it's only the foe of love if you have reduced love to merely a physical and emotional experience. If that's all it is, then sure, chastity gets in the way. But if you mean by love something more, something that's really in the good of the other that wants to lay down one's life for the other wants to put the other one for their objective good i mean i've looked stupid and like you cannot tell me that sleeping with her is you're doing this because you're putting her good first and foremost and that's what you care about more than anything else like mm, no i guess that's not because what's happening in that moment <laughs> is you're you're privileging your own physical and emotional experience over her good or vice versa over his yeah. good and so if you really love the person chastity is the prerequisite to allow such a love to develop and friends i think you know we know this. It's like, if someone's willing to fight that battle for you, mm -hmm. what could they not do for you? It's easy to sleep with someone. Mm -hmm. If someone's going to fight for your purity, like you've struck gold. So, yeah, chastity yeah. is prerequisite if we mean by love a deeper love that's more than simply a, a physical and emotional experience. Yeah, I, I think that that's. I mean, when I when I talk, you know, especially to high school, college, young adults, you know, and you know, they always say, "Oh, Sarah, it's the love test. Like, it's the love test." and you know, how can you, chastity takes away the love test because, you know, you want to know if someone loves you. It's like, what are you willing to do with me? What are you willing to do for me? Are you willing to sleep with me? It's the love test. It's how, I mean, how many, how many people have we counseled, Jason, who in the email, it's like, well, if I stop, if I stop having sex with him, then he, he won't know that I love him. Or he told me if I don't sleep with him, then I don't love him. And I'm like, okay, um, <laughs> call me. We need to talk. You know what I mean? So I, I always say, yeah, I'm always, and I, and I say this in my, in, in a lot of my talks, you know, I just say to people, I'm like the love test, you know, your love test says, if you love me, then are you willing to sleep with me? I was like, what if I told you the true love test isn't what are you willing to do with me sexually, but what are you willing to sacrifice for me? Yeah. Like that's really the love test. Anybody can sleep with anybody. It's very easy. It is not easy to say, I'm going to rise above what I want in this moment because it is a good, if it's in the context of marriage, but I'm going to rise above that. I'm going to set that aside. And I'm going to rise above my emotional, you know, sexual desire. I'm going to rise above all that. And I'm going to choose you. I'm going to choose what's best for you because I don't know if I'm called to marry you and I'm not going to take from you. What's not mine. Like it, it, I always tell people, we say this all the time. If someone can fight that battle for you, what can't they do for you? And I saw that in sloth. I remember that was something that I, I like our relationship was the first one we had post conversion. And I remember just thinking about that. I was like, man, I'm watching this guy die to himself in the way, again, you, you don't fall when you fall, you fall 10 steps before that. So he had all these rules for us. Like, you know, like we're, we're not going to do this. We're not going to go there. We're not going to do this. Da, da, da. He had all these things. And I was always remember thinking like, wow, that's like awesomely thought out and kind of extreme, but like, we need that. And we, Jason, we get so real in the book. Oh my gosh. We talk about our engagement. We talk about chastity. We talk about the things that we, like, we actually decided not to kiss the whole year. We had to postpone our wedding 
like six months in, into a year. So we decided not to, we started in Novita to St. Joseph and we didn't kiss for that whole year. And we wrote about it in the book because so many people are like, yeah, but practically, how do we stop sleeping together? Yeah, but practically, how do we have good chastity? You know, because Slav and I, we were like, no, we want to, we want to save ourselves from marriage. We want, you know, we don't want to sleep together until we're married. And we said that to each other, but that means a lot more than just, hey, we should try this. You know, yeah. we should really do this. You know, it, it means so much more than that. And so chastity became for us, it was like, this is, this is grit. This is gritty, man. This is called, we don't watch movies together. We don't lay down together. We don't make out. Like we do all, these are things that we don't do because mm -hmm. they never end well. So yeah. we wrote about all this in the book because we know that there's people out there going, I dig what you're saying. How do I practically do this? And how do I explain this? I mean, we wrote this book so you could hand it to someone and be like, hey, like, especially the guys out there, we have so many young adult men and men that are like, what do I do? Tell me what to do and I'll do it. And, and that's what Gift and Grit really became was, gosh, I we want people to be able to read this, but especially the guys out there that are struggling, who uh, these women want them to lead the relationship and they're like, I have no idea what you're talking about, you know? And that's not their yeah. fault. They don't know. And um, the dating blueprint is so phenomenal. Like my boys, I made both of my boys read that. They're freshman year of high school. Like, and they loved it. They loved it. And it's just nice to have people who say things that people can step back and go, okay, that makes sense to me. What does that look like practically in my life? So people can take the, you know, our story, your story kind of practicals and go, mm -hmm. I want to put this into motion, but it's gritty. That's why the word grit comes in there. Cause it's not easy to just yeah. not go with what everyone else is doing. It's very hard. And we're not pretending for a minute that anything we talk about is easy. It's just worth it. One yeah. discernment thing that Sarah said before with emotional virtue, your books, gift and grit. Like if that's what you want in a relationship, let your significant other read it. Mm -hmm. and, and see how they react to it. And and, and you always yeah. say, like, don't say, hey, didn't you love page six? Don't like, answer like, for them. Because that'll tell you a lot. Like, do they want the same thing or do they not? Are you dragging them along or do they sincerely want the same thing? Because if they won't even read a book with you and talk to you at dinner about yeah. the book that you're passionate about, if they don't even care to read the book and they don't care to have that conversation with you because they want to bring it up, Okay, that tells you a lot yeah. already. And then I always say to the men and women, if you know, if you say, "Hey, I really want to talk about you know chapter ten, whatever," to have you know a conversation about chapter ten, and then you go, "What did you think of what Sarah said, or what did you think of what Andy said, or what did you think of what Jason said?" Yeah. And it's just like dead silence. Just sit in that silence. Just do not mm -hmm. do not jump in and be like, "Well, this is what I thought," because you yeah. learn nothing. You learn nothing. Yeah. You have to watch them the wrestle with it, and if they say like, "I didn't like it." Like, okay, well, what didn't you like about it? I mean, you're literally mm -hmm. learning what that person's core virtue, faith, yeah. makeup, ID, you know, all of their chromosome. You're you're listening to it in real time. And so many people, I have counseled a lot of people, we all three have, where they're like, I just don't know where they stand with all of it. We haven't had that conversation. Yeah. I don't want to talk about it. Yeah. It's like, these are the most important conversations. Blame it on you. us. Bla <laughs> blame us. We don't care. I know Jason doesn't care. Like, yeah. well, I don't mind saying, well, you know, what did you think of what Sarah said? Like, well, Sarah, you know, Sarah said it. It'd be like, okay, well, I guess we're just not going to work out because if you, you know, blame us, we don't care. And, and I think that it's really important to have those conversations. And we love being a catalyst for those conversations. Yeah, no, this is the, this is the real test. This is the love test right here. I give him that. I mean, I remember <laughs> speaking at a, a high school girl once. She told me that she heard my chastity talk. This is a long time ago. She got it on the audio cassette. So this is going way yeah, back. And I'm talking about. So she brings her boyfriend over to her house. They're up in her bedroom. Uh, and he, she puts it in like the audio cassette player and starts playing like the old school, like, uh, I think, it was, I don't even remember what the talk was called 20 something years ago. She starts playing for yeah. it and he gets a drift where that's going. You know, he hits the eject button, takes the cassette, opens up the bedroom window from the second floor. <laughs> he throws it onto the front lawn, you know, and she's sitting there and I'm like, okay, you got your answer right there. Yay! Exactly. It, it's not that, you know, it, it's not that, you know, sex isn't a big deal. No, no, no. He doesn't think you're a big deal. That's the problem, yeah. you know, and right. so you want to test the love, read it, read it together. How can people get a hold of this and get a hold of you guys and the good work you guys are doing? Oh, thank you. We went ahead and just did the swafford.com and just put everything there because it was so much easier. Um, yeah. And there's a store on there. We love signing the books for people and, you know, making them out to your friend. If you want to buy one for a friend or as a gift or something like that. Uh, we love that. It's also at Ascension. Um, and it's, we, you know, to be honest, it's one of those books that we really love people. We've had a lot of people just like emotional virtue and all of your books, they buy one and then they give it away and have to buy another one. So, yeah. uh, I love it when people are like, Hey, you signed this three times, but I just keep giving it away. It's like yeah. one of my favorite things. 
I, I think it's one of those great pass around books where you read it, you go, I really would love to have other people on the same page as me. Um, especially friendship, you know, if you're just looking for a bunch of good friends, it's a great book to read together and be like, let's be intentional and get on the same page and not just pretend like we're all on the same page when it comes to chastity, yeah. sobriety, excellence, faith, prayer life, you know, all, all the things that are hard to talk about, but they're the essential parts of having a great friendship or relationship. Yeah, there's so discussion questions in the back, please jump in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we tried to make it really easy and try to make it an easy read because we know people don't have time, a lot of time. So it reads fast, which is great. I know people, yeah. my next hand has a stack of books like this, this big. Uh, but one of the things that I really loved about Emotional Virtue is um, I wrote it because so many people were telling me, you know, if someone is like, like in love with God or excited about the faith, I can give them 50 books to read. But what makes them read that first book? And mm -hmm. Emotional Virtue was such a good like gateway drug for people. Yeah. It's like, this isn't intimidating. It's about relationships. She's nice. She loves you. Um, and we really wrote this book in the same exact way. It's not intimidating. It's very much a lot of storytelling, a lot of experiential knowledge. And then also just, we're proud of you. We're praying for you. Like you can do this. It's hard, but it's worth it. And sometimes it's easier to hear that from people you don't know than your own friends, you know, that, that encouragement and Hey, this is how it's going to look. It's, it's hard, but this is how it, that's how it might look. And it's going to be amazing and there's freedom in it, but it's hard. And so sometimes it's nice to have that to hand to someone instead of you having to be the person like people, I know Jason, they say that to you all the time. It's like, can you just come talk to my friend? <laughs> like, yeah. like just take Jason and bring, bring Jason to your friend. And, um, it's like, well, we wish we could do that, but the books are a great way to, to, and they can read it on their own time. You know, it's not a conversation that's, I don't know how to react. It's like, no, just read. And, and, and then we'll talk about it after you've read it, which is awesome. Yeah. I remember one mom calling our booking agent asking, and she was ready to pay to fly me to her house to give her son a chastity talk in the living room. So she's like, he'll sit on the couch and Jason can stand up near the kitchen. And I'm like, I'm like, I love the idea, but why don't we uh, have it at a church, open it up for the public, bring 400 of his friends, make it slightly I'm less awkward. And so, high, yeah, I'm pretty sure his little high school needs to hear the same thing. So let's do it that way. Right? Yeah. So if you can't bring the swaps to your living room, she's like, what's a check? I'll write it out. I'm ready. Yeah. I'm ready. It's yeah, so if you can't bring the swaps to your living room, do it this way. Get Gift and Grid. Go to theswafords.com. Thank you guys for coming on the podcast. I'll put the link in the show notes for everyone to click there, connect with you guys through social media and all the awesome stuff that you guys are doing at Benedictine. Awesome. Thank Thanks you. God bless, guys.